Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rez Mani. I'm an application scientist for uh, Allied Scientific Pro. And uh, today uh, I'm going to give a talk about cannabis grow light. Uh, my email is mentioned in here. And this presentation, along with the, a link that has the video, will be mailed to all the, all the participants who registered. So you can listen to it. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, send me an email and ask me. Or after this presentation, you can also type your question. Just make sure to select uh, as to send it to everyone because you can either send it to the presenter or to everyone. So if you could just type it so that everyone could see the question, it will be great. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, talk about these items here that I mentioned in the outline. But before uh, I start, I just want to mention that our company is neither uh, a grower, so we don't grow cannabis, uh, and, and nor we, we supply lights uh, or you know, grow lights. Uh, what we supply is the, the metrics for measuring the lights. So that's the main product that our company has in, uh, in uh, UV and also in invisible range. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, first I'm going to talk about comparison of outdoor growing versus indoor growing, uh, whether you're going to grow it in a greenhouse outside or in an indoor facility. Then I will talk about different phases of growth for cannabis plants in an indoor uh, setup. And this includes the germination phase, the seedling phase, uh, the vegetation phase. And during that vegetation phase, uh, we also, also talk about the grow light requirements and what triggers the, the next phase, which is the pre-flowering phase. Then pre-flowering phase, uh, uh, how to identify the sex of the plant, uh, the necessity to separate the male and female plants during in the pre-flowering phase and, and, uh, and then we would move on to flowering phase. Uh, what are the light requirements for that phase? Uh, how do we deal with power interruption? And finally, the harvesting phase. Uh, then I'll move on to talk about different types of uh, lighting, uh, the pros and cons of different types of lighting for, for cannabis growth. And, um, uh, and I also talk about the effect of UV light for growing cannabis. Uh, that's a relatively new field of research. Uh, and so uh, how was, does UV affect the growth of cannabis? And finally, I'll do uh, finish the presentation by making some conclusions. So let me just double check here for a second how many people are there. So there are six there. That's good. So that has increased. Okay, so let's move on. So outdoor growing versus indoor growing. What is the difference? So uh, the main difference is that in the outdoor uh, growing, uh, everything is affected by seasonal changes. So in summertime, the length of the days are longer. Uh, in wintertime, it's shorter. So the lighting is provided by the sun. So uh, the changes in the in the sun cycle would affect the growing. And also in indoor growing, the, there's more control over the environmental parameters, uh, like, uh, for example, temperature, light, humidity. And uh, one can have even uh, different methods of growing cannabis with different properties. Like if you want to change the uh, the mixture of uh, THC versus CBD, you could probably employ different methods in indoor growing to, to, to do that, to accomplish that. Whereas in outdoor growing, you're pretty much, uh, uh, you can say controlled uh, or limited by the environmental parameters that are there and, and the sun cycle. And the sun's spectrum is, is constant. Uh, I mean, the color temperature varies but the spectrum is what it is. There's no control over it. So there's more control in indoor. And then the other uh, important factor is that uh, indoor growing is more protected from storms, weather changes, drought, et cetera. And um, uh, 
uh, also, uh, you know, the, the, the actual control that you could use by having timers and things like that would, uh, would make it easier. Uh, in some areas that are very cold, you can't grow cannabis outdoors all the time. Uh, whereas if you are using an indoor facility, you can just work 365 uh, days a year and, and grow it, no problem. So let us examine different phases of indoor growing in a cannabis growth facility. Here is a picture of a cannabis growth facility and you can see there are artificial lights that are employed there and, and there's probably some kind of uh, temperature control system, humidity control, and some kind of irrigation system as well. So you can use devices like timers, computer control, artificial lighting, temperature control, irrigation system, and, and also metrics to measure the grow light. Because in order to situate the plants at the right height, the right distance from the light, you should try to uh, measure the amount of light uh, that is falling on them at the canopy level. So it's quite important to have some metrics. So let's just start with the very beginning, the germination phase. So you start with some seeds and uh, uh, you can put these seeds uh, on a wet paper towel for a few days or maybe even 24 hours in a warm place. And you'll see that after a maybe 24 hours, uh, these, their tap roots will come out. And then as soon as you see that the tap root came out, you can uh, basically place them in some fresh soil. Uh, so uh, at this stage uh, where you place these tap roots in the soil, there's no light requirement. You just basically cultivate these or plant these. And next comes the, the seedling phase. Uh, so after a few days uh, from, uh, you see that the plant actually starts uh, growing, it comes out. You see a stem comes out of the soil and uh, it has these leaves that you can see in these three pictures. Um, originally, I think uh, if you see on the picture on the left side, you have uh, two leaves that are, uh, that are uh, just not serrated. They don't have this sawtooth feature. And uh, on the, so this, these ones go from Northwest to Southeast. And these two ones from right to left, they are serrated. But eventually those two leaves that don't have any features, they disappear. And instead of them, all the leaves uh, that are serrated or sawtooth shape come out. And typically each plant will have anywhere from maybe five to, to seven, seven leaves. And they have a very uh, distinct, distinct feature. Uh, so at this point, at the seedling phase point, uh, you would want to have a, a moderate intensity of light. You don't want to expose it to too much light because it, will, it will, could burn the seedling. So maybe a 12 hour, 12, 12 hour uh, light, 12 hour, dark uh, period would be suitable for this. Uh, and uh, normally at this stage, the seedling will grow to about eight inches tall. Now, next comes the vegetation phase. And this is after maybe uh, two or three weeks after uh, the seedling has, has grown, uh, the vegetation phase is start. And uh, it could typically take about four to six weeks for this vegetation phase. Uh, that's if you're growing it outdoor, it will take that long. But normally, even if you're growing it indoor, you should wait about four to six weeks for the plant to grow to two or three times of its original height. So it will grow uh, maybe uh, up to two, three feet. Uh, during this phase, this, the uh, marijuana plant requires a lot of lighting. So uh, what is important for this stage of the growth, as far as lighting is concerned, is a lot of blue light. Uh, of course, it needs red light as well, but it should have something like 12% of blue light. It consumes 12% of blue light. And um, also the duration, the cycle should be at least 14 hours 
but a lot of growers start with 16 hours of light and eight hours of darkness and they shine light uh, for 16 hours. Other growers choose to, to, to shine uh, 24 hours straight uh, and they just believe that this will increase the productivity. Uh, it will not damage the plant, but others think that uh, the plant should have some downtime uh, some rest time so possibly about anywhere from say 16 to 18 give it about six to eight hours of rest would be useful and continue this for about four to six weeks uh, so uh, the question at this point is that what kind of lighting used to use for this phase so if you use uh, for example hps lamp uh, high pressure sodium is not a good choice because high pressure sodium has only three to four percent of blue light and that is not enough you need 12 percent so the better choice would be a metal halide uh, lamp or a custom led lamp uh, which has about 12 percent blue would be much better so here let's let's look at the uh, the light requirement more so uh, I think it's common knowledge that um, all the plants, including cannabis, have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. And um, both of these chlorophylls have absorption in the blue region and also in the red region. So there you can see that the chlorophyll A has two peaks here shown by the, the purple color and the chlorophyll B also has two peaks. So it's important for the light to, to, to cover this range. And also here is uh, an example of a comparison of metal halide versus HPS. So you can see HPS uh, although has blue, but it doesn't have enough intensity in blue. So it has only three to 4% blue, which is not good. So metal halide, which is shown on the right side has much more blue. So it's more suitable for the vegetation phase. Now, uh, let's look at some of the processes that are, that are taking place uh, in, in the plant that are related to light. So we all have heard about photosynthesis, but this is photosynthesis is not the only process. There's also photomorphogenesis. These are the two main processes. So for photosynthesis, basically the plant just uh, uses sunlight and uh, carbon dioxide and water and converts that into sugars and biomass. And as a byproduct, it releases oxygen. So this is the way plant lives and everyone knows that. But there's also the, the process of photomorphogenesis, which is conversion uh, or development of, of form and structure in plants affected by light. Uh, so this is, uh, includes the quantity, uh, quality, direction, and periodicity. So the plant responds to all these, uh, all these uh, parameters, what the quality of light is, how much light there is, in which direction it's coming, and in what period it's offered. Like what is the cycle? Is it 12 hour, 12 hour, 16 hour, eight hour? So depending on all these parameters, it could develop its, uh, its, its shape and its form. So some plants could have stronger stems, they could have uh, bigger leaves or grow in a certain direction. So all these uh, physical parameters are classified under photomorphogenesis. Now, the thing is that although red and blue light may be sufficient for photosynthesis, as we saw in the, in the curve that the chlorophyll A and B have only absorption in uh, red and blue region, but uh, I, there are other uh, wavelengths that are also required because they affect uh, photomorphogenesis, the shape of the plant. So there has been research done that a plant, two identical plants were grown under, one under red and blue light, the other under white light. And after they grew, uh, the one under red and blue light uh, crumbled 
and you know collapsed under its own weight. But the one under the one that was grown under the white light uh, grew a strong stem and stood straight. So photosynthesis is not the only uh, 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 criteria here, and chlorophyll absorption is not the only criteria. Um, it may be useful to use other wavelengths as well as provided by white light. For example, green light could penetrate deeper into the canopy and could reach the inner parts uh, of, the, of the, the plant more. Okay, so what should we change when we go through this period of four to six weeks and uh, after that we want to enter the flowering stage? Uh, what uh, needs to be changed is mostly or mainly the cycle. So we would switch from six hours of light, eight hours of dark to 12 hours of light and 12, hour of, of 12 hours of dark. And this simulates the change of season because uh, the, the cannabis vegetation phase takes place during the summer. At the end of the summer, it enters into a flowering uh, stage where uh, the length of the day shortens. So uh, the change in the cycle uh, would trigger the pre-flowering and flowering stage and let the, uh, the plant move on from vegetation to pre-flowering. But what is the science behind this is that there are two types of uh, phytochromes inside the, inside the plant. And these are pigments that affect physiological processes in the plant. And uh, this is a, a red phytochrome and the far red phytochrome. So for far red, we define, define it as uh, wavelengths around 700 to 800 nanometers. So it's, uh, it's not in the visible region. So there is a balance between the far red and red phytochromes uh, during the vegetation state. And what stops the plant to, to, to move on to the next stage, which is the pre-flowering, is the presence of the far red phytochrome. But, uh, but if you start to increase the, the darkness from 16 hours to, or from eight hours to 12 hours, uh, then uh, some of these uh, far red phytochromes change into red phytochrome. And therefore, uh, there is nothing to stop the plant uh, to move on to the pre-flowering stage. So, more hour of darkness, the far red phytochromes gradually change to red phytochromes and plant exit the vegetation phase. Now, what happens if there is a power interruption? Uh, so during the, 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 the uh, light hours of 12 hours of light, there's a power interruption. That is not a problem, really. Uh, well, if it is one, two, three hours, it's not a problem. But if during the, the dark hours, uh, suddenly the plants are exposed to light, that has a bad effect because uh, it's more sensitive to exit the flowering stage. So the, the harm could be done if a light is introduced during the dark hours, but there's no harm done if during the, the light hours there is darkness. So exposing the cannabis plant to light during the prescribed 12 hours of darkness may stop the flowering phase. So after you uh, change the cycle to 12 hour, 12 hours, um, uh, I also have to mention that uh, at this point, uh, some growers start to go back to uh, HPS lamps uh, because the plant does not need as much blue as in the vegetation phase. So uh, you could live with 4% uh, of blue and the rest in, in red. So uh, after you change the cycle uh, to 12 hours, 12 hours, and maybe even change the lamp, uh, you will see after a few weeks that uh, the plant will show its sex. So uh, you can see the female and the male plants. And the way to distinguish between them is that male plants have these sacs that are shown in here. And um, uh, the growers at this point should uh, immediately uh, isolate the male male plants and throw them out. 
So as soon as the sex of the plant is shown, like here, the female plants, they are showing these white lines uh, over here, but here there are these sacs. So the reason that you have to isolate and throw, throw out the male is that if you don't do that, uh, these sacs would eventually break and they will impregnate the, the female plants. And they start growing seeds and, and basically spend all their resources and energy to, to, to grow the seed. Whereas uh, this is not a desirable effect for the, for the grower. Uh, what the grower wants is to, uh, for the female plant to grow uh, cola buds. And that's where the cannabis comes from. So you don't want the male, plant, the male plants to pollinate the female plants. Uh, so you have to get rid of the male plants. And this is again a 12 hour, 12 hour cycle. So next comes the flowering stage where these cola buds will grow out of the plant and there's some hair that is grown out. These are called pistils. Uh, you can smell the cola buds in the air. And, uh, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can also change the uh, the lamps to HPS lamp because it doesn't need as much blue, but still needs a lot of light. So, uh, so there's a variety of choices there. Next slide, uh, talk about different types of lighting for cannabis growth. Here is I'm comparing natural lighting with artificial lighting. There are various choices for artificial lighting. Uh, so, I talked about some of the difference between outdoor growth and indoor growth in the first slide. So I'm not going to go through it again. So the last stage is the harvesting phase, which obviously doesn't need any light, but I just thought I'll mention it that when the pistols grow orange color, it's time to cut the branches and it's cut time to harvest. Uh, so the branches are cut and they're basically hung upside down, like here in this picture, and they're dried for a few days. And then, uh, then uh, all the, the leaves are, are collected and they're placed in jars like that and they're dried. And every day one has to open the jar and give it some air and uh, uh, till after a few days, it is ready as the final product. So let's go back again to the lights and the choices of lights, the pros and cons of different type of lighting for cannabis growth. So uh, the first type is the fluorescent lighting. Normally fluorescent lighting is used for smaller farms, not like a big farm because it's, uh, it's low cost, easily available. Uh, it can be used with standard sockets and comes in two different color temperature, the 6,000 K color temperature and the warm day light 2,700 K. Um, the standard day light, which is 6,000 K is good for vegetative phase and the warm day light is good for flowering phase. Uh, what are the cons? Uh, as I said, they're used mostly for smaller farms um, and they the light output is usually low as compared to other types of lamps. Then there, there comes the HID uh, grow lights, uh, high intensity discharge lamps, which include metal halides and high pressure sodium. So this is two example, this yellow one here is high pressure sodium. And this one is the metal halide. Uh, what are the pros? Uh, the HPS of warmer color temperatures compared to metal halide. Uh, metal halide usually more suitable for vegetative phase and HPS which are red shifted are better for flowering stage. HID labs have low initial costs. So what are the cons is that you need the special sockets. Um, you cannot plug, be plugged in a regular bulb socket and the HID labs are very power hungry. So the electricity bill goes up. But for larger farms, may be useful to use uh, HID lamps. Then you have the very popular LED lights, which are growing every day in popularity uh, because of several pros that they have. They're energy efficient and they run at cooler temperatures, so it's possible to bring them closer to the plants 
without burning them and they don't require a special ballast to work. Uh, they, uh, they could be plugged directly into normal outlets. Uh, what are the cons? Uh, uh, basically the costs, the initial costs are too high uh, for long-term operation in big farms. Um, uh, basically the, the low consumption and heat produced will pay off the high initial costs. So what I'm trying to say mostly is that the major disadvantage of LED lights is a high initial costs. But if you try to use that in the long term, it will pay off for its high initial cost and may not be easy, as easily available at, as compact fluorescent lamp. All right, so what are the role of metrics in here? Uh, we need to uh, take away the guesswork from um, uh, measuring the light uh, because we want to have the right intensity and we also have the right wavelengths. As I said, in some stage you may need more blue light than red light and in another stage you may need more red than blue. So uh, before there used to be four different sensors, the PAR sensor, which is uh, photosynthetic active radiation, I uh, measure that and ratio of R to IR, which is for shadowing effects in plants, a lux meter and a spectrometer. And all of these have been combined now into the uh, one spectrometer called the Lighting Passport, uh, which is offered by our, uh, our company, Allied Scientific Pro, and uh, a very um, uh, user-friendly uh, user interface, graphical user interface could uh, measure all of this at the click of a button. And all the measurements are done uh, uh, basically using the Bluetooth communication. It also has a, a software called SCAL, Spectrum Genius Agricultural Lighting, that is suitable for measuring all the parameters and graphing everything. And then you could email all the results to yourself. So this is a very useful tool for that. Uh, one feature that this offers, the SCAL software offers is a reference spectra. So depending on what you wanna grow, it will tell you what is the correct uh, spectrum that you need. So for different plants and pigments of the plants, SCAS software provides reference spectrum. So for example, here for cannabis, which we call it medicinal plant in the software, you can see that this is the reference spectra with a large peak in blue and a rather smaller peak in, in, in red. So this uh, depicts the vegetation phase of the, the cannabis. So once you measure uh, your light with the lighting passport and this software, you can see here is a light that has blue and red and has relatively small blue and, and a large red. So it compares it with the reference spectra. And then it also calculates the weight of the spectrum or what they call the yield photosynthetic uh, flux density by multiplying each value of the spectrum at a particular wavelength by the reference spectrum, uh, which is a number from zero to one. So you will weigh the, the spectrum. And uh, for example, here you can see that the wavelengths that are more than 700 uh, nanometers are in the spectrum, but they're not in the YPFD spectrum because once you multiply by zero, uh, it doesn't, the, the reference spectrum doesn't have a value more than 700, then they just disappear here. So uh, it's a good way to measure and to judge what is the efficiency and usefulness of the light source here you're using. Then there's these diaries, uh, daily diaries, where you can actually monitor the growth of a plant and measure all parameters, PPFD, lux, color, temperature. Uh, you can also measure environmental parameters such as temperature and humidity, take a picture of the plant and the light source. And this way you can uh, make several measurements during the day and during even a month, for example, and then uh, plot certain parameters, do some uh, analysis. Uh, for example, here I've made measurements. Uh, I put this lighting passports um, uh, and 
I didn't move it for the first three measurements. I didn't move it. So it measured the same amount of PPFD, uh, which is just uh, light photons. Um, and then I put it in a dark place and then I put it in a very bright place. And then I could actually plot uh, the variation of PPFD. So this can be done throughout the, throughout the month and the plant's uh, response to the light could be monitored. So these diaries are very useful of keeping track of how the, the plant is growing. Uh, here is uh, our newest uh, a spectrometer lighting passport navigator, which has only few basic functions. It could measure color temperature, uh, the color rendering index, illuminance, and spectrum. And for, for uh, a long time, uh, we found that there are customers who, who just want a few basic uh, applications or, or a few basic measurements. They didn't want all the complex features that other models would um, offer. So this model was offered right now. Its range is from 380 to 780 nanometers. So it starts from the ultraviolet and goes into the far red region. Now let's talk about the role of UV. So how are we doing with the times? About 30 minutes. So let's uh, talk about the role of UV because it's a, it's, it's a relatively new uh, uh, field of research and still more needs work needs to be done on that. So plant grown outdoors get a fair amount of UVA, UVB, but 9% UVB and 91% UVA. So how do we define the UVA, UVB? UVA is in the range 320 to 400 and UVB in the range 290 to 320. And you can see the location of the UV spectrum in the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. So it's a tiny region here. So this is uh, visible. So you have UVA, UVB, and UVC, which is from 200 to 290. So we are uh, lucky here on Earth's surface that there is the ozone layer in the stratosphere at uh, peaking at 220 to 25 kilometers. And, uh, and this ozone layer blocks all the UVC and it would allow uh, about only 9% of UVB uh, to reach the surface and maybe 91% of UVA. So the unit on the x-axis is the Dobson unit, which is a measure of column of ozone. And uh, Dobson unit is the number of ozone molecules to create a pure layer of ozone at TSP. I should have mentioned 0 0.01 uh, millimeter thick. That's missing in here. So a unit, uh, which is number of ozone molecules uh, in a, to create a pure layer of, one, of 0 0.01 millimeter thick at the standard temperature and pressure. So the ozone layer basically is three millimeter thick and is 300 Dobson units. So this is for outdoor growing. Uh, and also let's look at the transmission of the glass. You can see a normal glass also starts falling uh, a little bit around like 350. So it, it will start to block some UVA. And when it comes to this area at 320 and below, the transmission drops to maybe about 10%. So the glass grows basically blocks most of UVB as well. So the total solar radiation that reaches the ground, 5.2% is UVA B and B, 94.8% are visible solar IR. Uh, so if you're growing cannabis outdoors, uh, your plant has some protection against UV and UVB due to transmission of glass itself. As it's aside from the ozone layer protection, you also get some protection because glass cuts down UVA, UVB. Now, uh, what is the role of UV? This uh, trichome resins laden with THC absorb UVA and act as a sunscreen to protect cannabis plant from UV damage. Uh, so what happens is that if you expose the cannabis to UV, uh, the plant starts to protect itself by producing more THC, which will, which will absorb 
the uh, UV radiation and act as a sunscreen. So we, if you want a, your plant to have more THC, uh, it is advisable to um, expose it to uh, some levels of UVA, UVB uh, uh, two weeks before harvesting. So that's the, that's the common knowledge. Uh, so this would um, increase the potency and would also have some effects as like photomorphogenic responses are improved, uh, increased resistance to microbial attacks, increased potency, better taste, and things like that. Important points about UV exposure to cannabis. Okay, what are the important points? Is that when we are talking about the increased potency, we are exclusively talking about THC. In fact, if you want more CBD uh, to be produced, it's not a good idea to um, expose it to UV. And that's why most of the growers who want to grow CBD, they do it uh, in an outdoor environment where the glass would cut down the UV exposure. Uh, so two weeks before uh, the, the harvesting, the cannabis should be exposed to some levels of UV, and this will increase THC production by 20 to 30 uh, percent. The UV exposure causes uh, the plant to go some stress, go through some stress, and this is stress causes production of more uh, THC. THC is a good sunblock and absorbs UV rays effectively. Uh, major stress comes from UVB rays uh, in the range 290 to 320, but UVA rays also stimulate trichrome production uh, that in turn uh, facilitate the production of THC. So this is uh, some research that has been done by one of our colleagues and I have uh, included it here. So how to measure UV? Uh, uh, we already talked about lighting passport that measures the visible and, and, and far red, uh, but for UV measurement, we have another instrument called SRI 2000 UV illuminance spectrometer, and that could measure down to 250, which is also in UVC, because it could measure all of UVB and UVA, and it could give you the LUX and the PPFD and all these parameters. And uh, so, this way you can take out the guesswork out of the UV illumination from the, the growth facility. So to conclude, uh, let me just go through these points one, one after the other quickly. Each phase of cannabis plant requires a different type of lighting. So the vegetation phase uh, and the flowering phase required different. The cycle is also different from 16, 8 to 12, 12. Uh, for vegetation phase, HID and LED are the best uh, lamps, but for the flowering stage, maybe HPS would be better. Uh, what lights to choose depends on many factors, including size of the growth area, stage of the plant, for example, CFL lamps are preferred for smaller farms. Uh, metal halide are preferred for larger farms. Metrics play an important role in monitoring the plant growth life cycle. Then uh, uh, the lighting passport, the SCAL software are very useful to monitor uh, the, the lighting for, for a farm. And UV exposure two weeks before harvesting may have some benefits for cannabis plant including increased potency. THC absorbs UV rays and acts as a sunblock for cannabis. And finally, the SRI 2000 um, uh, illuminance meter is a suitable metric to monitor UV exposure. So I think this took uh, something like uh, 40 minutes. And if, thank you for listening. If there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. You can type the questions. If you have any questions, you can type it. Yes, Daniel, you have a question. Thanks for your, oh, you're welcome. Thank you for listening.
Please type your question. Okay, let me, let me, let me see. Do you feel that there is something lacking in the currently available lighting products for the cannabis growing market? If yes, where? That's okay. I can answer as much as uh, possible. Lacking in the currently available lighting products for the cannabis uh, growing market. I don't see why there's something lacking because there are all kinds of lamps, the metal halide, uh, especially the LED has a lot of flexibility in how you design it. So depending on what you want, if you know exactly what you want, you can uh, design it using LED. So depending on this phase that you're growing, your cannabis, uh, you can find a suitable light. I don't think there's anything lacking. What's the next question? How do growers currently change the light cycles between cycles? Do you know if there is any ways that growers can currently change the blue red content of the light for different phases? Well, I know for a fact that there are, I've seen in shows, uh, in horticultural shows. And in fact, I went to a cannabis show in Seattle uh, called Canacon. Uh, um, back in February, and I saw that there are some, uh, you can say, manufacturers of grow lights that have uh, tunable intensity uh, lights. So their LED panels had blue and red, and there were several buttons, and if you wanted to increase the proportion of red to blue, they could do that. I mean, if you email me, uh, and you have my email on the, on the presentation, I can give you some leads as to you know where to look for companies that have uh, products where you can change the proportion of different colors. Do you know if flickering has an effect of the plants? Uh, I'm not sure about the flickering, but I know that lighting password could measure measure flicker. So I have not read anything about this, but if you are concerned about the flicker, uh, uh, the, the standard model of lighting passport could measure, could measure flicker. So I can give you some more information about that. Any other question? To increase THC, you just increase UV two weeks before harvesting. Is there a limit as to how much UV you can provide before there is a detrimental effect? You may have mentioned this, sorry, if you, if you did. Well, it's not that you increase UV, you don't have any UV basically before that. So you have to start the UV exposure two weeks before, before harvesting. But uh, as to how much exactly you have to provide, I have to refer to some papers. I didn't really talk about that. I don't have numbers off the top of my head right now. But there are some papers that talk about effect of UV. Uh, so how, how many micromoles you have to provide uh, is a subject of research. So I can I'll dig into those papers and see if I can find some answers. You're welcome. Any other question? Is the growing application available to versions, to all versions of, uh, well, the SCAL, which is the Spectrum Genius uh, Agricultural Lighting Software, I'm not sure about this new uh, new uh, instrument uh, that came out. Uh, it may may be extra, but I know for a fact that if you purchase the uh, standard version of Lighting Passport, uh, yeah, the Navigator. I'm not sure about the Navigator if Navigator includes that or not, but the standard version would definitely have that. What I suggest you do is you could go to this website, with I, which I, uh, I type here, 
www.lightingpassport.com. Uh, uh, and there, and there, if you go there, you can just see there's a table that compares different models and, and says what is included, what is not included. So there's a comparison table on this uh, website, which you can go to everyone and you know compare different models. In some models, you have to pay extra. Yeah, you're welcome, Daniel. And feel free to email me. And if I, uh, if you email me, I'll send you some more answers about, uh, you know, like level of UV and things like that. Any other questions? Okay. So if there's no other questions, I thank everyone for listening, and uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, you know, we'll have more presentations in the future. If you have any questions, please feel free to 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 email me. Thank you. Bye.